Welcome amazing agents and investors from across the country. Today is Thursday, December 5th, 2019, and this is Mastermind call number 255. We haven't spoken to you all in a couple weeks. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Um, good to be back here. Good to be with you again. Uh, the only thing I want to say, I, we kind of always focus on it this time of year. Obviously, take the time off necessary to enjoy your friends and the holidays, but at the same time, um, realize that a lot of your competition is not going to be working for the next few weeks. It's a, it's a great time when you're not with family and uh, you're not celebrating the holidays to get out there and make something happen and get 2020 off to a good start. And that's all I have. Tim, anything you want to share with the group this week? Uh, no, pretty much kind of the same thing. You know, we every year in January, what we hear on the first few calls in January are people who did exactly what you said. They they use this time to not only regroup and make sure they're ready for next year and line up their marketing programs and all the things that are necessary to do that, but they uh, they do work hard, you know, over the next period of time, certainly taking time off to enjoy holiday time with their family, but uh, they get right back at it and get it done, and those are the people that historically rock it the next year, and uh, we're encouraging you to do the same thing, so good advice. Absolutely. Our coach, Chad, is on the road today, so we are going to fill in for him and um, facilitate the call. I know Kat is on, and uh, Tom, are you on also? I believe our, our uh, other partner, Tom, is on and muted out. But uh, All right, well, we do have three people in the queue, guys. Don't be shy. Hit star six and hit one. And first up this week is phone number ending in 4426. You're up first. Hi. Thank you so much. Can I actually go second because I'm in the middle of pumping gas? Can, uh, yeah, what I will have to do, I'll have to drop you, but then just hit, as soon as I drop you, hit star six and hit one again, and you'll go to the end of the queue. You know what? I'm, I'm almost done. Sorry, I just didn't want to have a lot of background noise for you guys, but I'm almost done if you can, if you guys can manage it. All right, sure. Um, it doesn't sound doesn't sound too bad. What's your name? Okay, my name's Dorit. Hey, Dorit. And I just thank you. Hi, I just did the mastery class in November and um, really enjoyed it. And so my question is, I'm I'm working a probate lead right now. Um, that's a really unique situation. The well, it may not be that unique actually, unfortunately, but the caregiver for the woman who passed away. Um, falsified a grant deed, forged it with a stolen notary stamp, and mm. got got the deed recorded. And mm -hmm. the deed's now on title. Um, and so I guess I'm just looking for a little bit of advice. I've gotten some advice from a few different um, directions, and I have a couple of questions, and I'm also just wondering if anyone's had experience with this. So um, so the, the title is now, the title is the title now, is is te yeah, and it's technically, if, you know, when the title company searches, it's going to be the, in the name of the caregiver? They, they're the well, sole owner of the property now or not? Apparently, um, apparently the PRs, the PR has a friend who's in title who said that when they search, they see the the person who passed away on title. And when I talked to a title company, they said that when you do a title search, that it's going to show the previous title subject to any new grant deeds, but that because this deed was done without title insurance, that the title company would require an affidavit from the previous grantor saying, yes, this is legitimate. Um, Sorry, it's kind sure. of a complicated issue. Yeah, where, where I was going, where I was going with it though, it, it, she didn't just record a deed. I mean, she didn't just record a lien. She she basically no, it, deeded the property over to herself. In, you know, basically, fraudul yeah, fraudulently. Yeah, okay. Fraudulently, yeah. yes. So we yeah. we managed to track down the notary whose stamp was stolen. She is, you know, giving her, you know. She's, you know, giving paperwork and giving her testimony basically saying that, you know, this is Good. not me and I didn't notarize this and all of that. But it's not 
it doesn't seem to be an easy, like, okay, the judge will just take this off of title. Um, it seems like we might have to go the quiet title route um, or that, you know, the family might have to do quiet title with this sure. whole process. Um, sure. But one question that I have about it, because I'm not familiar with reverse mortgages, um, mm -hmm. and the family that I'm the family that I'm working with and helping, they are not very experienced either, and they have kind of a simple understanding of the things that the reverse mortgage company is telling them, and since I don't have the experience, I don't know either. But okay. the reverse mortgage company is saying that because it's a reverse mortgage and it's different than a regular mortgage, that no one is allowed to sell the property except the person that they got the reverse mortgage with. So the previous person who passed, or the executor, or if they're, the executor's attorney okays it. But they're basically saying that this caregiver is not even going to be able to sell the property because it's a reverse mortgage. And I have never heard of anything like that, but I don't know a lot about reverse mortgages. Sure. Sure. So let's let's kind of unravel it one thing at a time. First of all, we have to sure. give the disclaimer. We're not attorneys, and the yeah. law does vary, vary from state to state, you know, so obviously, you know, double check with the attorney. And that actually was my first question. There is, I'm assuming, there is an attorney who's handling the probate already in place? There is an, yeah, there is an attorney in place. Okay, because that's certainly the person I would start with to unravel this, because to, to go with your last question first, um, I mean, I cannot imagine that um, that a reverse mortgage is really, it's a mortgage. It, it should not be right. too much different than a regular mortgage. And, I mean, you, the, the lender always has the right to call the mortgage due. If You know, th that's probably what they're saying is that, you know, they, the, the property should not have been deeded over without them being notified and, once they're notified, they could call the mortgage due, but it, it still doesn't invalidate the deed because people people do subject to all the time with, with mortgages that are, you know, due on sale, and it it, mm -hmm. it doesn't automatically invalidate her deed, I don't believe, if that's what you're asking. Um, I, think that, I think what they're, what she's saying, you're right about everything, but I also think that the other side of this is that this would never clear probate court well, they would never release the lien with that right. person on it because they never accepted them as a lien holder. Correct. Yeah. That's so, the issue. Right, right. I, I, first of all, do you, I'm assuming you had the relationship with the legitimate executor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do you have the property listed yet? No. Uh, we're investors, so we're actually looking to purchase it cash. Um, I see. Yeah, but we are, you know, a little bit scared of, of even getting it under contract with the issue, you know. Well, I, yeah, I, I, that would, if, if, whether you're a realtor or an investor, I would say deal with who you know to be the legitimate person and get something signed because this is going to be unraveled. I mean, it might be days or it might be six months, but it will get unraveled. And if it, fraud is fraud, eventually, you know, the judge will invalidate the deed, or, or the title company will do a a, a suit to to quiet title, and that that lien will go away. Um, in, in, I mean, I, I'm assuming that you and the seller have agreed on a price that you're happy with. They're willing to sell it to you, or you're not sure. Uh, basically, we we um yeah we basically did, but I think at this point, uh, so they're in a different state and they're feeling a little bit overwhelmed by all this. They've already spent sure. like $7,000 out of pocket, and now they're feeling like, well, how much is this quiet title going to really end up costing if she fights it and all these other fees? So they're actually thinking about giving up the property to the mortgage company and just walking away from all of it. Wow. What a shame. That's what I was going to ask you. Is, is, there, if there's an, is there enough potential equity for you to, to take over the fight for them, you know, yeah. and, and there is enough equity there? There, yeah, there is. So there, um, the reverse mortgage is about, it's at about 330000 It's, you know, accumulating every few weeks. And we offered them three seventy-five. dollars um, 
so they're but they already have a bunch of fees and you know they're if they do a quiet title and they do you know they um, file for full authority because they had filed for limited um, and they don't really have the time to do the whole court confirmation process because of this reverse mortgage sure. um, accumulating what are you talking about, Bird? Huh? The, is that is that in the background where you are that noise or is that no. one of my partners? Tim, I think that's I think you. It's one of your partners. If on, <laughs> yeah, if you're on speakerphone. Not me. Huh. I heard a dog. Maybe it's maybe it's Tom. I heard somebody playing with a dog in the background there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so what do you think the property is worth? Um you mean like ARV? Yeah. Or you yeah. mean like as it is right now? Cuz it's a mess. Probably, uh, as it is now, both, both. What do you think it's worth as as it is now and after repaired value? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it could go for three eighty as it is now. Um, there's another house, actually, there's a comp that sold for three eighty. That's almost exactly the same, um, like a month ago to an investor, and, and I think that's on that okay. same street. Yeah, and they were willing. To, um, and I, they were willing to take. They were willing to take three forty five. You said the seller. Three seventy five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, that's pretty tight for you to for you to buy it for three seventy five and put all this. That's what I was trying to get at. Put all this time and oh, effort into it. Oh, I see. It. No, I think I think we could. Right. I think that we could. Um, I think that we could wholesale it for um, three ninety, maybe three ninety five. Yeah. I'm I'm not quite sure, but. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Well, are you it's, planning to wholesale it, or are you going to do work on it and try and retail it? We're planning to wholesale it or wholesale it. We might clean it up and then and then sell it, or we might just wholesale it the way that it is. Yeah, like Jim said, that's a lot of work for for potentially not a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. It it honestly, I um, it, it doesn't lend itself well to wholesaling or whole, it maybe hotel wholesaling because eventually you could close on it and you know the mortgage isn't going to go up that much but to wholesale you're going to have to wait quite a while until you can really confidently promise it to an end buyer you know and get get a contract on it i mean honestly i think i yeah. would i would try if they're willing to just sign it back over for 345 um you maybe ask them to sign it over to you and and give them a five that five or ten thousand dollar note. You know, tell them, hey, we'll do the best to unravel this, and if we're successful, we'll pay you on mm-hmm. the back end. It's certainly better than than just you know losing everything. But if it were me, and I was going to put all this time and effort required into it, I'd, I'd have to have a pretty big upside. And if yeah. if they just if if they just quit claimed it to you now, and you recorded the deed, and maybe gave them a note for five thousand dollars as a second. Well, eventually, when it all unravels, you're going to own the property, and they're going to get something out of it. I, to me, that's probably the only clear path I see. And and uh, and I assume that you've had some pretty good conversations with the uh, with the attorney already, or or not. What's the attorney's plan on this? Does he have a, a plan to to clear the title? The attorney recommends following the Liz Pendants and quiet title. Okay. Yeah, that's what. That's yeah. what their attorney recommends, but they've been kind of wishy-washy about it. Um, yeah. But I think I think this is an interesting idea. So could so a can they quit claim it to me when they're not on title, and and can they do that without court confirmation? You can you can record anything. You can uh, re- execute and record a deed, uh, anything, and it it's you know it it won't become completely valid when you record it it really is valid because the one clouding it is 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 fraudulent so mm-hmm. yeah you you in most states you can i mean we we have a guy here that doesn't even do work on houses and he goes and records a lien so he can get paid at the closing i mean there's their fraud is prevalent everywhere and you mm. if, if you take a deed down to the courthouse typically in most places they're going to record it or if you give it to an attorney to record they'll record it and once the um you know, it'll become market. It's valid, in my opinion. It would be valid right away because the other one's fraudulent. But it wouldn't be marketable. You wouldn't be able to do anything with it until the until the title's cleared, until the I underlying other, you know thing goes away. Novel. Yeah, I got one other novel suggestion you might want to you might want to try. 
I assume that the, from what you said, the reverse mortgagee has potentially said they would uh, they would accept the property back. In other words, they would be willing to take it as a surrender. Is that right? I believe so. I, from what the family is telling me, it sounds like they may have addressed that with the mortgagee. Do you know what the what the uh, what amount of money the reverse mortgagee is holding on it? What the balance is? I think it's right, about right. three thirty. Yeah, I think it's about three thirty. So there is a possibility of because they really the they're the they're going to have to do a, a release of that mortgage for it to get cleared anyway at some point, and you do have a possible play of going to them and attempting to let them go ahead and release it back to them and buy it from the reverse mortgage company and yeah. uh, negotiate a deal with them to start with and then let the title clear and then you're buying it for a lot less than you'd be buying it for if you buy it direct. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> And I was also going to suggest you may they may even be willing to do a short sale. They may take less than three thirty just to, to get it off their plate. This is one that, uh, as my partner likes to say, it's got a lot of hair on it. It's a it's not an easy <laughs> deal, but but sometimes those the hairy ones are the ones you get paid the most on. I so, take a whack at yeah, the first mortgage company, and not only that, the other side of that is if you if you it's a great opportunity to establish that relationship, and this is not the first nor the last property that they have, and if you become a disposal vehicle for them for investment property on anything that they're holding reverse on, anytime something hits probate that they've got they're holding as a reverse mortgage, you're the person that they're going to call, and I would not miss the opportunity to try to build that relationship. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that's a great idea. So I know the name of the reverse mortgage company. Should I try to find out the loan broker's name or just kind of call them with the address and say, hey, who do I talk to? Whoever's going, whoever's going to get you through the door, pretty much. That's that's kind of. I mean, if yeah. you can, that, whatever's going to make it work. And I think you should probably let the let the folks know. You just want to keep them quiet for a little bit if you're going to try and go do that. You don't want 16 people talking to the people you're trying to make a deal with. I would say, right. hey, I've got some things up my sleeve. I'm working and I'm trying to get some things done here that'll be beneficial for all of us. Uh, before you do anything else, let me see what I can do. Give me a week to put this together and then I'd, I'd maybe take a whack at doing that. I'm not saying it's going to work, but you got nothing to lose by trying that angle. Yeah, I'll tell you what, no, you will, what you will what you will need. You'll need an authorization to release information, and your title yeah. company has one of those. You, you'll need to, you'll need to have, say to the seller, say, well, if you give me permission to talk to your lender, I'll give them a call. Let me see what I can do, and then just have them right. sign it. Otherwise, otherwise it's confidential. They won't talk to you. But if you have that, you're just like a short sale company or an attorney who has permission to talk to them, and they will talk to you. Okay. Okay. That's great advice. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, this Thank you guys good, so good. much. Oh, you're very welcome. Come back and let us know how it turned out. It's it's an interesting situation. They, they, don't, they don't happen. They're not common, but it's certainly not the first time we've heard something like that before. So, unfortunately, yeah. there's a lot of fraud out there. But it, it will sort itself out, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be left with some profit for all your efforts. So, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. You're very welcome. Next up is phone number ending in 2076. You're up next. Hi. Uh, yes, this is Gisela Dominguez, and I'm here in uh, Southern California, Whittier, California. And um, I just uh, started uh, with my first uh, batch of leads, and I'm kind of like working on mailing them out, and I wanted to ask, um, do you put a return address? Uh, uh, do you handwrite it, or how do you put the return address? I'll let you take this one, Tim. Tim's our sure. our mail guru. So <laughs> here's the reality: we don't, we honestly don't recommend that you do that. And part of the reason for that is that the data that we've gotten, and it's, and I won't say this is highly scientific, but it is. We've been doing this for five years, and you get better open rates without uh, without the return address on there. Uh, everything that we mail out on behalf of our customers, 95% uh, of them do not put the return address on there. You're not going to do anything with it if you get it back to begin with. So the point yeah. being that we do a really good job of trying to make sure that we we 
we break our, our backs making sure you've got good addresses. So having it come back to you is not going to get you anything anyway, and it just gets better open rates without it. Oh, okay. Okay. Fantastic. That was that was my question. And now let me let me I just really ask you let me ask you a question. How many how many leads are you uh, how many leads are you dealing with at this point? Uh, well, um, I just started uh, my first uh, November history one, um, and um, I should be getting another batch like on the twenty fifth. But this one is like 40, 44, 44 okay. leads. You're gonna you're gonna do these yourself. We're not doing them for you. Is that your is that what you're doing? Yes, yes. Okay. Unfortunately, for now, I have to do it myself. No, that's fine. That's fine. And you know, we're here to yes. help you. That's that. I, we we do it for you because we know that long term, it's far more efficient for you to do that. And we do a good job yes. of making sure they get open. But all I'm saying is, you've got a, a very manageable amount if you want to do them yourself and you've got the time, you can. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't put the address on. I wouldn't put a return address on it. I'd just send it out. Okay, perfect. Okay. Also, I also I wouldn't if you can avoid it, if you can avoid doing so, I wouldn't send it out another in a number 10 envelope with a label on it. Make it make it look different. You know, make it a hand hand address the addresses. If you only got 44 of them, you can take the time to do that and we uh -huh. we we use and they get opened a lot better is a greeting card style envelope, like a pastel or a colored greeting card style. You want it to look like I always use the analogy, you, you, you want it to look like a birthday card or a wedding invitation. You just want it to look like personal mail, not like the rest of the mm -hmm. junk mail they get. It'll get open. Oh, it, it's okay. a little, it, the postage is the same. The only thing, the only difference would be the envelopes will be a little more expensive and you have to take the time to hand write them, but it, 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 it'll be worth it in your open rate. Oh, okay. And how about the stamps? Do you do you have the lady? Do you get like, um, you know, like regular stamps or or the ones that they come out of the machine at the post office? It doesn't. It doesn't make a lot of difference. But it again, as, as Jim okay. said, as Jim said, given given the count that you have, you may want to just get a you know distinctive stamp of some kind. The price is the same okay. for doing that. I mean, the issue with all of this is that. You know, you're you're not doing it in volume, and you're not trying to do them really quickly. You've got the time to invest in it, so you know, make it look as different as you can. I wouldn't use the regular uh, uh, stamps that you get. Go get you know commemorative stamps or whatever else that you can get to put it on there to give it a distinctive look. Okay, great, thank you. And <laughs> the other just the other little tip I'll give you is that you want to. We do the same thing with the mach the, the machine mail that we do. Put Put your stamp on a little bit crooked. Put your address on it a little bit crooked. Make sure that it's obvious that you did it by hand. I mean, we do that. That's what we have built into our software so that we mm -hmm. don't make them look clean and precise. It ab absolutely, that's why our open rates are as good as they are, is that we make sure they don't look like somebody did them with a machine. And anything that you can do to do that, that's what we do mechanically. You need to do the same thing when you're doing it. Okay. Okay. So make it look uh, uh, like a little bit crooked and. <laughs> yep, okay, beat it up a little bit. Nice beat it up a little bit. You want okay. it open. You know, it's a fine line. I know realtors want to look professional and and you know the, make sure the letter, the content is professional. But you got to get it open first. There's a local investor in my market that is just ridiculous, and he's. I stand at the at the wastebasket with my mail and you know throw it away, but he's got me to open his We Buy Houses letter three different times. The last time. It came with an incredible Hulk sticker on on the outside of the envelope. It looked like a child had addressed it, but it got he got me to he got me to open it. I thought it was one of my grandkids or something. That that's the goal. Get it get them to open it, and then you, you know, know. yeah, yeah. They had to make the the content as professional as you can. People people will appreciate it. They won't hold it against you if it doesn't look perfect. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. All right, you're very welcome. We have two more in the queue, guys. We're only uh, half hour into the call. We got plenty of time for more, so we're looking for some wins. We love success stories. We've heard a lot of them this week. I don't know if any of y'all are on the call, but please don't be shy. Share your successes with us. And next up is phone number ending in five nine five two. You're up next. Yeah. Hi. Um, 
Uh, hi, Jim. Can hey you there. Hear me? Yeah. All right. Is it Soji? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how did How did I know that? How you oh, been, Soji? <laughs> very well. Very well. I know my voice is distinctive. You know the reason I was calling. You know, um, you know I was just on the web on Facebook on the allthelease.com uh, mastermind group. And, you know, somebody put out something there that kind of like, um, you know, uh, I thought was a little, ne you know, kind of like disturbing. Because he said he had been doing this, you know, he had spent some money, but he didn't feel like the program was working. And there were some other people who were buying it, uh, buying into it with him, you know. But I yeah. remember, you know, how David Pannell, you know, kind of like saw yeah. something that he did that, you know, it took him about a year to get one listing, you know, by following sure. up. But then there was somebody else who said, oh, well, in California, that, um, you know, uh, California is different because it's really tight because the attorneys have plugged, you know, the wheels, you know. So I was just wondering, you know, kind of like, uh, anything you guys could sh share to shut out that this kind of myth? Yeah, and and I appreciate you, um, you know, mentioning that, Soji. We we're very we could like to be an open book. We don't censor the comments there on Facebook, but you're right. Whenever generally, whenever you see a, a less than positive comment, ten people will jump in and kind of defend the program, so we, we very much appreciate it, and I mean, let's face it, some people are going to be more successful than others, some people work the program, and some people try to, you know, reinvent the wheel, I, and I think what you're asking me, I mean, there, there is no doubt that some markets are more competitive than others. Um, New York City is a classic example. We had six subscribers in New York City that told us it didn't work until uh, a guy named Seth came along and made almost a million dollars his first year. And, I mean, he told us in his market they were getting 100 pieces of mail, but generally he was the only person calling. California is very competitive. Um, in markets like yours, are you asking me if that's – what are you asking me, Soji, like how to compete in a competitive market? Is that the, the yeah, question? You know, or? Kind of, yeah, something like that. Also, you know, kind of like uh, in a competitive market like this, how to overcome, you know, kind of like so that, you know, like I win, you know. I mean, sure. I've gotten some, I've gotten some listings, you know, kind of like uh, from, you know, uh, my subscription to, to all yeah. the weeks. You get what oh, I, mean? I know you have. And, and you, yeah. there is not a market in the country that's more competitive than yours. And, yeah. But so, to, uh -huh. to your credit, to your credit, though, you've hung in there. And yeah. the, the nice thing in your market, Soji, you don't need to do a deal every month to have it be immensely profitable because of your average commission. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could probably yeah. you could probably yeah. do. Yeah, um, I it, and I'm sure my partner Tim has his, some suggestions, but I in in two things that jump out at me in competitive markets. One would be our friend David Pinnell, who is going to make uh, I believe he's going to make close to a million dollars this year. He's in the Houston, Dallas metro area there in Texas, very, and that's, very, very, and that's very competitive very, too. Right? Hugely, com hugely competitive, but his forte is he calls people as many times as is necessary until he reaches them. He was telling us the story, someone he just did a multi-million dollar deal with, it was the 27th time he'd called them. So, so yeah. in competitive markets, everybody, they are getting calls. You know, there's some markets where our subscribers are the only people calling. In markets like yours, there are other people that are tracking these people down and calling them, but at most, you know, they call once, twice, three times. They don't right. keep trying. It, it kind of reminds me, like, when I used to work expired, I would purposely, the day a property expired, they get 100 calls from agents. A week later, maybe 10 people are calling. A month or six weeks later, nobody's called them in, in a month. So I, two, thing, two things I would say, just be relentless at, to keep calling until you get a hold of them and go back every once in a while and work your old leads. I would both mail and call. In a market like yours, I'd probably go back four to six months. The leads yeah. you never got a hold of that are four to six months and 
send them another letter. We've got a we've got a specialized letter that says, hey, yeah, I have done, you know, it, yeah. It, it, okay, yeah, it's been a while. You know, have you done anything yet? Yeah. And call them again. And the reality is, probably eighty percent of them are going to be listed or sold, but the twenty percent that haven't are nobody else has contacted them in weeks probably, and they're finally ready to do something. So it just requires, I think it requires more persistence, and it just requi it requires the attitude that you have that, you know, it's going to be harder, but it can still pay off hugely. Right, right. And the, then there's always the opportunity to go after that, too. Exactly. And, Tim, I know yeah. you had, you, you, I know Tim had something he wanted to add, too. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, and just the other thing, so I'd say is that, that you know, just as Jim said, there are folks that are doing really, really well by frequency of call and all that. The other thing that we have found and we typically hear, and you've been on these calls, I know you're frequent, you know, you're frequently on here, you'll find that these leads season really, really well. And what ends up happening is that in the first month or two, uh, there's a tremendous amount of competition, particularly in heavy markets. After the third month, uh, if you're still pursuing they're probably, you're going to be the only one that's doing it, and letters work extremely well then because that's a very cheap way to stay top of mind with somebody, and that has a lot to do with it. So I think we're finding that, and we've just added, we're putting them up this week, uh, both a six-month and a 12-month letter that are designed specifically to, you know, warm up a cold lead. And uh, Jim is, can also tell you that we've gone back uh, recently just as a test into some markets where we've been doing some dialing tests and we're, we've worked some old leads just to make some phone calls and there's lots of deals out there and in one county we found you know three opportunities just by doing one round of uh, telephone calls and it works well so the leads season well and in particular they season well in highly competitive markets because it's such a numbers game a lot of people just pester them Again, like David does, he beats them up hard, and he continues to do it. He gets a majority of them long after that probate's been out there. That's when he's getting a lot of stuff, and you need to do the same thing. You need to be diligent and keep on doing it for a while. Right, right, okay. Because I saw on one where he called the people over a year 17 times. You know, it was in that, uh, you know, he put it out. So, now, Jim, did you say you waited until the sixth week to call us fired? No, I said when I used to call FISBOs and expireds, just like everybody else, I would call them, call them, call them, call them the week they expired. But but I would go back, um, you know, when I when I was done with my regular calls, I'd go back and call the expireds that were six to eight weeks old, and you know, a lot of them had listed, but the right. ones that hadn't, they they answer their phone now because they're not getting nobody else is calling them. And right. So, I mean, they may have, if they haven't relisted, they may, they may have been expired for eight weeks, and I'm probably the only one they talk to because, you know, as soon as their phones start ringing off the hook, they just stopped answering. And, and the reality is some people, it, probate is no different. Some people, when, they're, when they, their house expires, they need a little bit of a break. You know, they just discouraged yeah. and they need a little break. And some of these probate people, I mean, they, they took the action, the executor, to to file the probate, so they're they're ready to sell it, but they they maybe just are not quite emotionally prepared yet to go through mom and dad's stuff and you know and to to get rid of the property. So you know anywhere from probate seasons, well, better than any other lead source I've ever seen. Uh, it's phenomenal how many of the year we we've had so many of our subscribers, you know, tell us that you know they tried it for a month and quit, and then a year later they got two listings went back and called the year old leads and got another listing or two. So there there's if you're getting a quantity of leads you're getting you you could go back two years and there still will be leads there that are now finally ready to do something. More probably more so than any other lead source I've ever seen. Well and you have to think about the reasons for that. I mean think about it. A lot of the other people that are out there doing it, if you've got a listing that's expired, you've got somebody who's trying to move, their pressure to get that done is much more so than somebody who has an inherited property there, the executor for it. Nobody's living in the house. The house potentially is free and clear, and the only thing that's going to have to get paid on it is taxes. And they can let it sit for a while, and oftentimes they do. 
And the good story that you can tell when that happens is that the challenge in letting it sit while it may be convenient and, you know, you can wait a while to get it done and you don't have the time pressure, the story that you need to tell when you're dealing with that is that the deferred maintenance then begins to significantly detract from the value of the property at the time that it does get sold because a house that's not lived in decays a lot faster than one that is because things don't get looked at. And, and that's also a very important thing to tell as you begin to prospect to these older leads. And that's one of the things that we touch on in, in terms of the mailings that we do and the things we teach you to talk about in regard to the calls. Talk about that deferred maintenance that's just beginning to mount up. The paint doesn't get better sitting there and the, the carpet doesn't, doesn't do well. So those are the things you have to focus on as you prospect to older leads. Right, right. Okay, that gets you going, Bob? Do you have any comments about somebody showing up in person? Showing up in person for at the to for the, the executor or the attorney? Yeah, to the to the executor. If they're local, but the the reality is in in our in the Sun Belt areas in Florida and California, a huge percentage of them are not local. And yeah. if you're going to show up. Um, if you show up to the property, they're probably not going to live there either. I mean, if, if you have a local address for the executor and you've tried everything else and it's really a hot property that you'd want to list, I mean, it, it, um, you know, it, it's worth a try. I don't know that I've never heard of anybody really having a lot of success with that. I, I think I probably, I think your percentages would probably be higher taking that same time and go personally visit the attorneys because they can give you more than one deal. Right. But um, okay. Tim, have you ever heard? Have you, heard, have you ever heard anybody stopping by the executors live that are local? Nah, not really. Yeah, I mean, it's not really. never. I, I never say. I never that. say. Yeah. yeah, I never say never. It just seems like a, a low percentage in, endeavor to me. I did. Yeah, I would okay. say the same thing. It's just a better way to spend your time doing more productive. It's one to many versus one to one, and you know you're better off doing marketing than doing individual visits. You want to talk to people who are motivated and you don't know how motivated they're going to be by doing that and sometimes you may it might it might be more more detrimental than not doing that. Okay. okay. In California okay. California Soji, it's not a short drive anywhere for, <laughs> for you to go out there. <laughs> All right, my friend, thank you so much. Any wins to share with us lately? I know you had a deal a couple months ago. Anything any new new wins that you want to share? Well, things are happening, man. Let let them finish up the first, and I'll share. All right, you don't want to jinx them. Get them under contract and <laughs> call back and let us know. All right, All right. thank you, my friend. Okay, All, right. All right, guys, we have two more in the queue. We do have room for more. Uh, next up is phone number ending in nine three nine three. You're up next. Uh, yes, hi. Um, uh, my name is uh, Ted, and uh, I'm from uh, Illinois. And um, this is my this is my first call. Uh, I'm registered for the uh, December 16th mastery calls, and uh, I, yeah, and I listened to the. I was sent the, the um, I think November's call, so I, I've listened to both of those, uh, uh, call one and two, um, and, the, and and as I listen to what's happening on this call, it, it it's like um, I had a, I have a sense of discouragement because earlier in the year I did another uh, probate course. Good, I had one transaction out of that, but it, it amongst everything else that I'm doing, because I also work expires, I also have, uh, I do networking and I have my sphere of influence and past clients, and then it seems like, oh my gosh, there's so much. And yet there's, a, and then there's only so much money going around to have other people uh, do the work for me. So, so it's kind of like sure. a conundrum there, but it, like it's all good. And uh, the previous, the former call regarding the mailing, the mailing. Um, I'm I'm using the large express envelope, like with a pen inside uh, and a letter. Uh, do you recommend? Uh, and that's sort that's expensive. It's three dollars and sixty six cents to mail that first letter. Sure. Everything. Else. Let me. Yeah. I'll let, I will let Tim handle that. But let me just go back to what you said about. Please don't be discouraged. We we try to, we try. This this will be the most. It, this should be the highest conversion rate 
and the most productive lead source you've ever worked. So if you're working, if you're calling FISBOs and expireds, and uh, I mean, I don't know what your conversion rate is, but it, it will be higher on probate. We're just, we just feel like a lot of people come in and they expect, they treat it too much like FISBOs and expireds. They, they expect all or nothing right away. And the point we're making is this, this is really a lead source where you can keep milking, that's not a good way to put it, but you can still drive benefits from the leads for a year after you get them. So long run, I think you're going to be way happier than any other lead source. And Tim, do you want to, you want to, I think what you're addressing are the, the, the oversized, um, like parcel type things that you the, deliver to the them, like the, the like UX, the full type express envelopes right. that you, you, yeah, it's, it's more like a marketing envelope sure. that stands out. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so, so yep. I, want, I also want to comment on what, what Jim said. Here's the thing that, sure. that we always, and sometimes we neglect to say this, and we should say it and make a point of saying it every time about the, the whys and wherefores of this. So if you think about what happens when someone passes away and someone becomes appointed as the executor and, and the personal representative, what ends up happening is that there either is or isn't immediate pressure to get that house moved. And if there's immediate pressure, there's immediate pressure for a bunch of reasons. They can be, they can be medical reasons. They can be educational reasons. They can be new housing uh, for a surviving spouse. Those are things that put immediate pressure to get that house sold. And those make those, those properties great deals for investors. And that's the people that really, really bang on people hard as, uh, when the probate leads become available. Now, we obviously are working with investors to some extent, but the majority of our customers are looking at this as a listing opportunity, and the seasoning aspect of that, it can be, sometimes it can happen very quickly, and, and people want to, they want to sell it quickly, but they want to sell it for top dollar, so they want to get it on the market as quickly as they can. That's an immediate opportunity for a listing, but that listing opportunity remains for a long time, long after the the low-hanging fruit investment opportunity may have in some respects gone away and not necessarily does it go away over time but that immediate low-hanging fruit isn't necessarily there because of the time pressure so that's why it's seasoned that's why we tell people when you start this you know you, you really need to be looking at this as a minimum of a 90-day approach to make this work extremely well that's when you'll really start building that you know pressure that you put on them by you're mailing them every month they're becoming familiar with you and in that period that's when the majority of these do begin to go it's certainly as time passes uh you know they fall out things get done with them the house gets sold delivered to another person in the family all that but your job is to be top of mind whenever that happens and i kind of hate that term because it gets overused but it's reality it's the last thing they saw that said that's the guy that specializes in, in probate. He can probably help me. And the more you can put in front of them that they open, the better off you're going to be. To your question about mailing, um, I think it's fine for you to use what you're using if that's something that you want to spend the money on to go do. It depends on your budget and, and what you want to do. We do multiple variations of that. We do our own letters that we send out <clears throat> that we've proven work extremely well over time. That's part of what we do for our customers. We also service uh, the stuff for Frank Patrick, which is the lumpy mail that you're talking about, where you exactly. literally put things in it to get their attention. And so we, we do both of those. It's literally a matter of budget, and all of it's designed to do is just get that mail open. That's, it's up to you kind of what you want to spend. Yeah, yeah, that's all good. Yeah, it's actually because uh, Frank Patrick, he's the one, he's the one like even recommending, hey, check this out. You got to check out ATL, all the leads. So yeah, so it's all cool. So I, I Frank stopped our doing that. You do really, people that do Frank stuff do extremely well because his open rates, in fact, are higher. It is more expensive to do that because you know the putting the pins in there costs a little more money and. The yeah. packaging is a little more money and all that. That's why it's more expensive. And he has his own unique style of letter. That's why he licenses it. So, uh, yeah. you know, we, we love Frank and, and both of the systems work. Ours are more, uh, you know, huge volume or larger volume. And Frank's are very specific and do a great job for people that are willing to spend the dough. Both of them get great return on investment. Awesome. I have, I have a couple more. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
A couple more comments. Yeah, pretty much, it's always that question. There's so many um, free sites to obtain address uh, contact information. Um, do you have experience or any knowledge in knowing whether to use the free, is the free site okay versus subscribing to that free site to get to receive information? Well, you got to be aware that, and, and this is kind of the most important side of this. Obviously, we you're you're talking about what we do for a living, so. We sell yes. leads, yes. and we spend our we spend our money on making sure that the leads that we provide for you are ones that the address and all of that information, both address and phone number, have been proofed out to the very best degree that we can do that. And so, certainly, we spend money to make sure that it's done right. If you're spending money on mail, you want to make sure that it gets delivered. You need to make sure that you're not wasting your money and not validating that address. But I'm, I'm going to frankly tell you that with you being concerned about getting a good return on your investment, you should be talking to us about getting our data and using our systems to do that because you're going to get far better results than what you're doing on your own by with what you're dealing with now. And I think probably one of the things that could be helpful is after this call, if you don't mind, we're going to have one of our people reach out and talk to you and kind of walk you through what we do, and then you can maybe compare that to what you're doing. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, and, and and my third thing is um, inside the four uh, from one of the uh, you have my number so that person can call me of course sure yep so um, the four options um, for real estate it, it's like sell it sell it uh, the real estate in a probate uh, it can be sold can be sold to an investor or it could be it could be a fix it up and sell it for full market or just sell it as it is using you know brokerage or creative financing the, the fourth item was creative financing and I was wondering about that and I think like especially now even working with expires there are so many folks that still don't want to sell because they feel they don't have enough they don't have enough uh, equity coming out of it for one reason or another that it's just not enough money for them so your experience, like for example, on the investing side, uh, the contract for sale, um, is that something that's offered um, to the estate by a realtor or for an, or or by the realtor? I can't see the investor doing it at this point. But a contract for sale, where where the 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 seller, the estate, would be the lender for the buyer. Yeah, and let me ask you, I meant to, to backtrack a little bit. I wasn't real clear. Are you a realtor and an investor or strictly an investor? Strictly an, no, strictly a realtor. A, a realtor. You're strictly a realtor. Okay. Because, yeah, and, and I had a comment about what you were talking about before, but um, creative financing, it's like it, it's no different than I don't think any other category. You're going to realistically less than 5% of the time is it going to be a viable option for the people but but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have it in your you know have it in your quiver in case you need it because there will be situations where you know the maybe the family is wealthy and they don't want to take the tax hit of you know of having a big capital gain and they'd rather you know finance it and hold the mortgage yeah. just be aware of those situations but don't I wouldn't focus too hard on it because for the the vast majority of these deals, there's going to be multiple heirs, and they're going to want to, you know, take that money and split it up among the heirs. So it it's it's few and far between. Where, you, but but that doesn't mean you can't offer it if the situation arises. You want to you want to be aware of it and have it for that you know five percent or so where it is a factor. And the the other thing I was going to say real quick, being that you're a realtor and you you, I want to get rid of that discouragement you had because not only is the time frame and the seasoning better on probate? But think about it. When's the last time you listed or called a FISBO that I mean, and expired? And the reason it expired was that you know it was underpriced. <laughs> have you ever have you ever had that happen? Properties expired usually sell because the the people want too much for them. For the most part, it's just yeah. the opposite with probate. These prop if this is found money. A good percentage of these people, you know, are more interested in speed than getting top dollar. A lot of them have deferred maintenance, so I think the quality of the of the saleability of the leads is going to be far greater than than what you're used to working. Also, 
that's a that's that's a that is a real a real good point. Yeah, I did yeah. I didn't look at it that way because many of those expires are expiring because of the price. And and with probate, I can see where well that's not necessarily the case. They just they prefer to get it sold. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way, anyone that that reviews mastery, I, I've been on, uh, uh, I, on the recordings. I hear that there's some. Um, uh, Graduates of mastery on the call. Is that is that at no cost, or do the do the yep. returning folks uh, come on the call? Uh, we have we have a we have a lady. I wish I could remember her name. That's taken it fourteen times. Once you <laughs> once you take once you take the course, it, you're an alumni. You can retake it every month for no charge. Oh wow! Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Today. Thank you. No, really good questions. Really good. Uh, participation we appreciate it well we mm -hmm. this is perfect timing we have seven eight minutes left and we have one person left in the queue so last up this week is phone number ending in one five five three you're up next okay great can you hear me can hear you great yes sir all right thanks uh, I recently found out about you guys I think Sunday and I bought the mastery class uh, signed up for the 16th I am a real estate investor uh, and I left corporate America in February, and I do this full time now. And I switched gears from doing wholesaling as far as everything other than probate to now jumping on probate and kind of putting everything else on the back burner. Uh, my question is should I begin? I've started my mailing campaign, and I've mailed out probably 30 or 40 letters, um, I think Monday. Uh, I do have telephone numbers. Um, and I recently found out that I actually know an attorney that does probate. So my question is, should I go back other than now, uh, like six months, to start mailing campaigns, or should I get the earliest, the better? So do you, are you getting leads from us yet or not? No, I'm not. I'm okay. My own. okay. Okay. Kim, go ahead. Well, I mean... The, the reality is it's, it's whatever you've got time to do. That's kind of the kind of the point. The, we, 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 have, you been, have you been on the whole call today? Yes, I have been on the whole call yeah. today. Right, and I think that the, I think the point that we've made several times is that these leads season very, very well. And, uh, you know, if that's what you're looking for, I think you're going to find that the, the, as far back as you go, I mean, at some point it's diminishing returns, but, you know, we've had people who have said, you know, two years ago, I got your letter, and I've been holding on to it, and, uh, you know, I did it. So certainly it's those are the opportunities that are there, and what you said is you have made a commitment to doing this, and uh, so if you've got a commitment to doing it and you feel like you're comfortable at it, I'd go back as far as my time and my budget would allow, and, uh, you know, the only thing I would encourage you to do at some point is to potentially consider getting your leads from us because, we do a better job, I think, of getting them than most anybody does, and we make sure that the contact contract contactability of our leads is better than anybody else's as well. We vet them carefully with the addresses and phone numbers so you can make sure your mail gets delivered and your calls are going to get answered. But certainly the, as far back as you want to go, uh, that's kind of up to you. And however far back you go, you're going to get, you're going to get better results. Well, I'm definitely going to have to call your your guys' sales team after I finish the classes just so I'll have a better understanding because I have rental properties and I'm a general contractor, so I just do not physically have the time. There's not enough hours in the day to pull it off by myself. So although I'm building a team, I'm going to have to incorporate you guys in that and see if we can kind of do something customized or just find out exactly what you guys do. Like I said, I just found out about you guys, and the day I did, I, I actually purchased the class. So. Um, yep, absolutely, and you'll learn everything you need. Everything you need to learn, you're going to definitely learn in the mastery class, and you'll be able to figure out, you know, the value that we bring to the game and what you want to use and uh, all that. So we'll look forward to working with you as soon as you get through that. Uh, yeah, because I don't think I'll miss uh, licking another stamp or anything else uh, at all. <laughs> Yeah, yep. Nope. You, you not you don't enjoy that lovely taste of uh, of horse? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, all right, sir. Well, thank you very uh, much. We do we do yeah. have one more person that jumped in the queue, so I'm going to close it now. This is definitely going to be our last call. Is phone number ending in eight four nine two? Your last. 
Hey guys, my name is Ryan. I'm I'm relatively new to the uh, whole state uh, whole state wholesale business, and just had some questions about kind of someone without a real estate license versus a uh, real estate agent in terms of credibility to people, especially with your leads, kind of who has the advantage, and if if you guys have any insights about that stuff. Um, as well as, you know, most property, a lot of properties that you guys are probably going to be giving us leads for, uh, for probate in particular, aren't going to be wholesale uh, material. So I'm just wondering, too, is it realistically possible uh, for, for me to maybe sell my lead to a real estate agent um, in the area for a little money and how much, you know, just stuff like that. Sure. Good, good questions. And, and I know Tim will have his slant on this also. And, you know, we'll, you're, you're our last caller, so we'll take a few minutes to answer it. The, what's really a, a unique about, in, about probate is we, we train realtors and investors exactly the same. And there, there's virtually no competition for, for one reason. Probably 10% of these properties, 10 to 15% at the most, are going to have some compelling urgency. You know, mom died, we got to get dad in a nursing home. I had one one time, the most profitable flip I ever did. By the time dad died, he hadn't made a payment in three years. The sale was scheduled at the courthouse in three weeks, and the family was broke. I, they, they weren't going to list with a realtor. <laughs> you know, I had, to, yeah. I had to jump in and hire an attorney to stop the sale. So you're going to know in the first 30 seconds of the conversation, if they have a compelling urgency, um, I had another one actually that was free and clear that I made a really good, uh, you know, payday on. But there was like twelve errors, and by the time they split the money, they didn't care. They just wanted to be done with it. But you're you're going to know right away. The ten to fifteen percent of them that have that compelling urgency are going to be investor only. They're not going to list with a realtor if they don't have uh -huh. that compelling ur if they don't have that compelling urgency. They're probably not going to be interested in investor offer. Um, we recommend that realtors find investors and investors find realtors. And you certainly could sell your leads. You, you can't um, ask a realtor for a percentage of the commission. You, I suppose right. you could sell the leads to a realtor. But what works better for most of our agents is take the ones that you know are motivated, but they're not ready to take your investor offer and refer it to the agent because – a good percentage of those, if two, three, four months go by and they're cutting the lawn and paying the electric bills and paying the insurance, they get they may get more motivated down down the line. And you want to have an agent that'll have your back if the True. situation cha changes. And I I would pick the most uh, productive. I would pick an agent that you one of the most successful active agents in the area and tell them, hey. I'm sure you have people calling all the time that you can't help because they don't have the time to list it. If I'm going to send these leads to you, I would expect a reciprocal arrangement where you you refer the ones back to me that uh, you know, and I'll be the investor. So it, it that seems to work better. You know, having a it's in the news a lot lately, but make it get a quid pro quo quid, quid pro quo. Uh, that's hard to say. Relationship. You know, where you give them something and they give you something back. That's probably going to be better for you in the long run. And uh, another thing, I've said this so many times, um, a number of the properties I bought, I was, I was very honest with the people. I would tell them, honestly, if you're not in a big hurry and you know, you're willing to put some money into the property, you could probably sell it for 300 But for me to buy it today, you know, I'd have to get it for 240 And the people told me, you know, I was the only investor that actually told them what the property was worth. So you, you'd be surprised uh -huh. how how far that'll go towards your credibility, because let's face it, people can Zillow. They they can they you're not going to fool anybody. It's pretty rare, you know, and steal something if they don't know it's a steal. So if you're if you're up front with them and you refer them to the people that can help them, and the situation does change, you're gonna you're gonna be the one they go to. And if they're weary, if they really need an investor deal, but they're weary of investors lying to them, you're really going to stand out. So try, uh -huh. you know, just try to try to be different than the rest of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that that definitely makes sense, especially uh, establishing the relationship with the real estate agent, you know, for down the road purposes. Sure. No, and no, no agent is going to turn you down if you're going to come to them and say, "Hey, I have these people who are are interested in listing a property. Would you like to talk to them?" If they're a listing agent, they're going to say, uh, "Yes, I would." 
And, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, that's a pretty easy entree to building a great relationship with a realtor. But, Jim, more importantly, I just want to hear you say quid pro quo a few more times. Quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. That's a good, that's a good tongue twister. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was good fun. That was that. Here, buddy. Good way to end this one up. That ended a little entertainment to the call. <laughs> does that help, sir? Yeah, no, definitely does. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Another great call. We, we muddled through it without our coach, and I think it went pretty well, guys. I, I can't thank you enough. I, you guys may get tired of hearing me say it, but I always end these calls the same way. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking an hour out of your, your week to be here. I want to particularly thank those that actively participated. And I want to challenge each of you. Take one thought, one idea, one thing that inspired you on this call. Go out and put it into practice and come back next Thursday and share your results with the group. Thank you so much, guys. Make it a great week. We will talk to you the same time next Thursday. Take care.